once uh, remarked, when in doubt, tell the truth. In the case of extremities, so uh, overdo that, you'll have to get yourself in. Well, you'll have to get that. What is the tip of my tongue? Uh, you'll have to get. Uh, oh, shucks, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Come on, I'm going to have to hit, get my head going. It's uh, if you try the truth too often, you're liable to get something in a sling. I can't. Thank you. Another one, Mrs. James Quirin of Wellington, Ohio. Yes, Mrs. James Quirin of Wellington, Ohio. We'd like to give her a big salute here tonight while we get our little fiasco underway here. As the failure of the week. <laughs> yeah, the dum-dum of the month. Hmm, the dodo of the first quarter of the year. Uh, our nomination for the Mickey Mouse of this time and age. Mrs. James Quirin of Wellington, Ohio. Is shown in this photograph, which I'm putting in my vast file of trivia. Yes. Mrs. James Quirin of Wellington, Ohio, ponders what to do with 87,000 Pepsi-Cola caps that she has collected. <laughs> uh, she's got them in gunny sacks, millions and millions of 87. You know how many 87,000 Pepsi-Cola caps are? Well, the Pepsi-Cola people were offering premiums for bottle caps. Mrs. Quirin wanted a mini bike. But she did not realize that the offer ended two years ago. <laughs> Once more, thank you. you Got to hit. The, oh, that cheap equipment we got. <laughs> it all stopped. Uh, all right, give me, give me, give me a little. Uh, give me a little. Uh, 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 let's say salute music, please. Uh, give me, give me a little salute music there, Herbert. Since that one pooped out on us, here we go. All together again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think a little nose flute wouldn't hurt this thing. You mind if I sit in on a nose flute? Thank you, Eric. Hold it over there, man. God, 87,000 bottle caps. And what a disgusting look she has got on her pan. Well, of course, uh, that, uh, that, uh, I, 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 I was euchred by a thing like that one time. I might as well admit it. Euchred. You know what the phrase euchred means? Suckered. Mousetrapped. I was euchred on a thing like that. I remember one time, Alex Joshua, this kid I knew, Chris, we, we, you know, we're, we're uh, scratch the, scratch the skin, the rind, the pelt of any 20th century man, and right underneath that you'll find a lurking sucker. Of course, this has always been the case. What was it that Barnum said about him? Yeah, that's right. Of course, Barnum, uh, way undershot the mark. I mean, if, uh, what did he say, one born every minute? Well, he did not uh, take into account the population explosion. I would say there's one born every maybe five or six milliseconds now. But uh, I was certainly one of them. Yes, sir. And he says, a sucker's born every minute. I have to admit, I was one. Joshua, and I was uh, in Cub Scouts, as a matter of fact. Yes, we were all in the Cub Scouts at one time, weren't we? Were you or never? You mean you never had one of the little beanies with the little thing, the wolf? thing and little oh you missed a great uh, slice of you did you weren't in the cub scouts we in the boy scouts no i'll be horn swoggled you weren't well you're the first guy i met in oh maybe two or three hundred years it wasn't in the wasn't in the cub scouts i i was in a wolf pack you know what is it a wolf pack that's a big thing you know and i had one of these little blue hats with the gold braid on your little yellow thing there and a little beanie and I had a, a a blue and yellow neckerchief, a little blue shirt, you know, and all, the whole bit, see. And it was in this Cub Scout troop. And uh, so was Alex Joshua in the same wolf pack in a very hard-hitting, angry crowd. And uh, Joshua one time come around there, and, and uh, he had he had uh, a whole pack of uh, Wrigley gum wrappers. You remember those uh, gum little gum wrappers around the spearmint gum there? 
And he had a whole bunch of them clipped together with a rubber band. And these, you know, these big wads sticking out of his pocket there. And, of course, immediately uh, all the rest of the guys in the cup back says, what's all that about? And he says, well, he says, didn't you know that uh, that the uh, the people that, that make the gum there, of course, we never chewed that kind of gum. I mean, the uh, Wrigley-type gum was for grown-ups. I mean, this is, I guess that still pertains, right? We used to chew something called flares. Yeah. Yeah, or double bubble. I mean, it depended on what, you know, there, there, there were the classical bubble gum chewers, which were the double bubble types. And then there was the avant-garde who chewed flares bubble gum. You mean you've never had flares? Oh, oh, that's a, that's a, it's, it's a, it's an esoteric bubble gum. For those with more taste than the others, we used to look at the double bubble types, you know, as just having big jaws and no brain. Yeah, they're fantastic jaw muscles, but nothing above them, you know, nothing but the, this little tiny pea-sized thing made out of cheesecake between the ears. But nevertheless, the <laughs> Flair's crowd, as, as along comes Josway with a whole pack of uh, Wrigley Spearmint things. And he he uh, casually mentioned in passing that the reason, of course, he was it was very hard to get it out of him because he was very secretive about it, that, that the people who made the gum there, if you got the right number inside the wrapper, there's a little number. Mm-hmm. If you got the right number, you would win a new Ford. Well, now, the, the new Ford prize has persisted throughout American culture. In fact, it, it goes back to pre-Lincoln days, when it was believed that if you got the right candle wick uh, that had a number on it, uh, the Ford company would give you a new V8. And, uh, yes, so, yes, disillusion has set in very early in the American culture with that kind of stuff. So, of course, the pie in the sky has always been with us. And the Ford and the rapper has always been with us, too. So uh, I figure, you know, it would be kind of fantastic to surprise the old man. You know, at the age of 10, that's a pretty big thing, you know, to announce loudly at supper that uh, go on out in front, Dad, and take a look. It's a, just go ahead, go out in front. It's a surprise. And, you know, the old man goes out, and there's a new Ford, you know. It's just <laughs> well, uh, you know, the hope springs constant and eternal. It does. That ain't the only thing, but the hope is one thing that is constant and eternal, but so is suckerism. So, uh, with that, I figure, well, you know, it's a kind of a fantastic thing. You could get the, you can get a, uh, you know, you can get a Ford for the wrapper. Well, now, I didn't go out and buy this gum. Don't, don't imagine that's what I did. What I did then, you know, I discovered a very interesting thing then, at that point. Yes, very, very fascinating. That, uh, I, I began to haunt the gutters of my tiny circumscribed Cub Scout world. And uh, every time I would go up and down the, you know, the streets and going to school and places and stuff, I would walk along in the gutter with one foot down in the, on the street and the other foot up on the uh, sidewalk. You know, get, that's why I lean even to this day because I spent a lot of time doing it. Yeah, well, I, got, I developed a permanent tilt. So we, uh, <laughs> no, you can't help it. Products of our early environment, there's no doubt. So uh, I'm walk up and down the gutters and and you know what surprised me was was the number of gum wrappers you find if you walk around and look for them it's incredible well so i i began to collect here's one right there see lee lee my producer in the room there she says she's hearing this and she jumped up there's one laying right by her foot well now you would not have noticed it had i not brought this up you said ah somebody's selling the garbage around it is a gum wrapper and a wrigley spearmint gum wrapper so Nevertheless, I, I uh, went up and down, and I started to scrunch in, in gutters, and within, I would say, oh, six months, I must have had seven big gunny sacks full of gum wrappers that I had found. They were overflowing. You know, I had thousands of them. Well, I, I just kept pulling in these gum wrappers. Now, I don't know what I expected to do with them. I, you know, I figured that the, if I opened up the right one and it said, and says, surprise, you got a Ford or uh, something like that, but uh, I I never heard from the Wrigley people. They never wrote to me. Uh, and as far as I know, Josway never got a Ford either. But uh, nevertheless, I think I was suckered because for a, the better part of a year, I was looking for gum wrappers. Well, now, you can't... I have bags of them under the under the porch down in the basement seat. And my mother would get really... Because a lot of them, you know, had been stepped on. Uh, yeah, I, I was not... I never overlooked a gum wrapper. Unless, you know, the kids don't make uh, the... Uh, they don't make differentiation there, and many of the gum wrappers have been more than stepped on. You know what Airedales do. Well, actually, 
There all kinds of stuff was clinging to my gum wrappers, and I had thousands of them, thousands. And uh, since that day, though, I have never yet been able to completely cure my gum wrapper twitch, which I still have. Uh, you know, figuring you know, maybe they were right. You never can. You never can. Uh, you don't know. You know. I mean, Wrigley's never denied it, as far as I know. I mean, they never. So who knows? You know, maybe somebody's getting the Fords. In fact, I saw my old man. You know, he also believed if he got the right Indian penny, the Ford people would send him a car. That was another room. You ever hear of that one? It's a great myth. So the old man had about 400,000 pounds of Indian pennies that he collected all over the place, see. And uh, when he found out that uh, not only did Ford not want to give him a Ford for all of his Indian pennies, they got mad when he wrote to him and asked him about it. And this is, you know, told him what to do with his Indian pennies. And not a very polite letter, as a matter of fact. They were not. So with that, yeah, <laughs> obviously, they figure any guy that says Indian pennies to get a Ford ain't got a Ford in his future. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you pick it up, you lay it down. So, uh, with that, the old man takes all of his Indian pennies, you know, about 28 million of them. He takes them out of the bank and he trades them for what he figured was good pennies. Of course, now if he had those Indian pennies, well, he could retire to, you know, he could live in Biscayne Bay like the president, you know, and the whole thing. So, I mean, the Indian penny king. Okay, you just make it big. And we have a little money maker here. Would you hit the button? You might expect our higher-priced cars to come loaded, but what about our lowest-priced cars? Well, take the Toyota Corolla 1200 sedan. The manufacturer's suggested retail price for this Toyota is just $1,956, plus freight, local taxes, dealer prep, and options. On it, you'll find at no extra cost front disc brakes, white walls, wheel covers, and tinted glass. The interior decor group is already built in. And the exterior chrome trim is already trimming the exterior. The fresh air heater is standard. The reclining bucket seats are standard. The carpeting, armrests, and four-speed transmission are standard. And that's not the high-priced Toyota. That's the low-priced Toyota. Oh, gee, that's a nice one. See your nearby Toyota dealer and see the full line of Toyota sedans, hard tops, and station wagons. But uh, I would like to, again, if I may, before we leave this uh, somewhat sickening subject, I would like to, again, uh, because it's probably the only time in our life that will ever happen to her, we'd like to salute, once again, Mrs. James Quirin of Wellington, Ohio. Still Doc of the Week. Now, let's see. I don't know how we got it. Yeah, you know, it's kind of sickening. Speaking of dildocs, we have another dildoc here. If I may salute another fantastic dum dum. Uh, so, oh, speaking of that is, yeah, <laughs> word association. This is W O R New York. Okay, we have a note here for uh, the Book Find Club, and uh, <laughs> these are not my comments. This is the copy comment. It says, did you ever read in bed and laugh so hard the peanuts rolled off your belly, or get home oh, when? Or get so absorbed in a book you forgot to set your alarm clock? Well, uh, there's a lot of books that the Book Fine Club has that uh, I think you'll enjoy very much. But the first one is Our Gang by Philip Roth. And the next one is Port Noir. Well, actually, The Defense Never Rests by F. Lee Bailey. And uh, there's all kinds of great stuff in this book. And if you are interested in some good reading and continued good reading, you should know about the Book Fine Club. They'll send you both of these books for one dollar. That's our gang, and the defense never rests, plus postage and handling if you call MU72552. As a book find member, all you need to buy are two more books in a year, and they're all quality books. So it's a good club to know about. The number again is MU72552, or send your name and address to Book Find, WOR New York. Say, Sabres, <laughs> here's an important announcement, and you guys that are able to save. Did you get a dividend credited to your savings account on the 29th of February? Uh, that's the question. You would have if you were a depositor of the Providence Savings Bank in Jersey City. It's the oldest savings bank in New Jersey because all Providence Savings Bank savers get their 5% a year dividend posted to their account on the last day of the month every month. That's 12 times a year. That's a 5% a year from day of deposit, the highest dividend rate, which is allowed by law. Now, you don't have to wait for the end of a six-month period or even a quarterly period for your dividend. They add to your account each and every month. So you might as well get the most on your savings and join up. 
You don't have to be a Jersey resident. You can join. There are over 82,000 Provident savers from all over the USA who know that Provident has never missed paying a dividend in 132 years. So don't lose another day's interest. Ask for the Provident Savings Bank Postage Free Bank by Mail Kit. It's free. Just They'll send it to you. Just write Provident in care of me, you know. W-O-R, New York. That's Provident, W-O-R, New York. Or you can call them. The number is MU26800 right now. The operators are standing by, and they're members of the FDIC. la ta Oh, yes, here's what I'm looking for. I've got it. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Dildoc. You would hear about him. Another one, another goodie here. <laughs> People, uh, this fantastic Dildockery is, is rampant. Salt Lake City, a 17-year-old driver led police on a 15-minute, 87-mile-an-hour chase yesterday afternoon and was finally caught barreling through a school zone at near 100 miles an hour. They finally got him. Officer Larry Haynes asked the youth why he did it. The youth replied that he already had a bad driving record and he did not want another ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it, officer. I'm dumb. Hey, officer, I can't help it. I can't read. Hey, please scratch my head for me. My foot don't work. Yeah, tell Doc. I wish you that. Well, it's spreading. I see. I have to salute my old alma mater. Yes, it had to come. Had to come. You can now get a credit at the old Indiana U. You get a credit there. They teach a course now in comic books. Appreciation. Retrospective. <laughs> that's right. That's neat. It's, there it is. Comic books now in the curriculum at Indiana U. Of course, that's nothing new. They've been teaching out of comic books out there for years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I don't think it's so bad being a Dill Doc. You see, one thing about being a Dill Doc... You enjoy things more. I think them, with them so-called pseudo-intellectuals, they don't enjoy stuff really. You know, they stand around and they gripe. But uh, it's kind of fun, I say, being a Dildoc. Me and all the other Dildocs, once in a while, once in a while we get over there at the McDonald's, you know, we play on them old teenage rock hit tunes, and we sing around, you know, we eat the fish sandwiches. And them intellectuals, they don't understand that kind of good times. So I say, it ain't so bad being a Dildoc. Hmm, thank you for tonight's testimonial. Now, uh, we uh, must return, however, to our scheduled programming here, which includes the latest strike returns. Yes, back we're now. Speaking of your nostalgia fans, this radio station is now making available, for those of you who are real nostalgia fans, a magnificent stereo album with full wall-to-wall magnificent sound, a stereo albums of my favorite strike bulletins of the 1960s. Yes, featuring such great luminaries in the strike world as the late Mike Quill, mm-hmm. and the uh, currently operating Harry Bridges, and, uh... Ah, uh, it's too late. That thing, what's the matter with it? What does it do? Oh, it rewinds? Yeah, that's the way life is. It's rewound. Yeah, it always rewinds 18 minutes too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we know. By the way, <laughs> wouldn't you like to buy an LP like that? Yeah, kind of good. Yeah, I remember. I remember uh, the late Mike Quill's famous line: "Lindley, John Lindley." <laughs> That's a great way of putting down Lindsay. I was pretending he never even could even remember his name. He'd say, "This Lindley, Lindley. What is he? What did you say his name was? My name is Mike Quill, and I do not have to listen to the stuff with the." Mr. Lindley. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. very colorful character. Uh, well, now wait, wait. We're not through. Speaking of colorful characters, we would like to salute another bad scene out there. Although I don't know whether this is a bad thing or not. I'm preparing something goody here. <laughs> you know, the Midwest seems to be a seething hotbed of nuttyism lately. I mean, you know what we're teaching comic books outwardly and admitting it in Indiana. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that guy running through the safety zone and all that stuff. Uh, look, right, so big excitement uh, in Chicago the other day. I hope you caught this. You know, it's the kind of stuff you never really hear in the news. Yeah, big excitement. 
Well, there's been, there's been excitement everywhere. I mean, it's just just been great. For example, you heard what happened in Lake Charles, Louisiana, didn't you? No, you didn't hear about it. Lake Charles, Louisiana. An armed bandit holding up the home credit company recently ordered the lady cashier to take off her pantyhose. He then used them to tie her up and escape with twelve hundred bucks. <laughs> what a great scene! Can you see them charging in there? <laughs> uh, crime marches on. God takes advantage of every new technical development. But uh, speaking of uh, great mysteries, uh, oh yeah, speaking of great mysteries, Chicago. John, oh John, John, oh John! There's a horse in our swimming pool. Yes. And in case you missed that, because you were going to the John or coming out of the John, I repeat it for you, John, John. There's a horse in our swimming pool. Yes, John Armstrong lifted his razor from his lathered face and looked at his wife Agnes. She appeared just as surprised as he was to hear what she had just whispered. They walked to the window and peeked through the drapes, and sure enough, there it was, a bay gelding standing in three feet of water and not looking the least disturbed. Oh, that's so long. <laughs> you want to hear the rest of it? Bad news. The Armstrongs surmised... That the horse, that's a great, that's a great, that's the only, that's a word that's only used in newspapers. I never heard of it ever being used in conversation. Like, have you ever heard anybody say, oh, well, Fred just averred he went down to Charlie's Tavern. Have you ever heard that actually used in conversation? A-V-E-R-R-E-D. Or, uh, say, excuse me, sir, I'm just about to aver that I'm going down to the charcoal and nuts to get me a brownie. Well, <laughs> So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is supposed to be an intellectual hour here. Well, anyway, the Armstrongs surmised that the horse had ventured into their swimming pool and had accidentally fallen through the nylon cover. It had a nylon cover to pull there, see? Figuring out how it got there was not difficult, oh no, but how does one go about getting a horse out of one swimming pool? Especially when the horse isn't trained to climb ladders. So after about two and a half hours with the fire department and everything, they got him out. And everybody was congratulating everybody else. With that, the horse walked off in the woods and has not been seen since, and they don't even know where he came from. <laughs> oh, God, it never stops. It never stops. It never stops. What never stops? It never stops, friend. It, 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 all of it. All of it. Everywhere you look. Ah! <laughs> Humble! <laughs> Screw this. I have to quote the Ebenezer Stooge there. Can I try it again? That's the eternal cosmic bar. And Cleveland, uh, Richard Burton, a public relations man for the Cleveland Art Museum, almost passed out. He received a $994 bill from Hermes, an exclusive shop in Monte Carlo. Nine hundred and ninety four dollars. The bill was for one skirt and two blouses. Bought by one Elizabeth Taylor Burton. <laughs> Old Richard Burton, whose wife's name is Constance, said he will not pay the bill. You realize whose bill he got. <laughs> Let you know how they, you know, that, you, I, I thought you'd like to know how the other 1% of 1% of 1% live. That's just one skirt or one small blouse. No, no, not with her. No, it wouldn't be a small blouse. So, no, no, not indeed. Uh, let's be realistic. Uh, do you mind if I bring on them mice again? One, two, three, four. There we go. Oh, 
Have you tried any lechery lately? No? Right, yeah, the six other sins are pretty exciting. I mean, if you I a particular like gluttony. By the way, gluttony is the only sin that today we recognize as a seven, you know, one of the seven deadly sins. All the others have actually become part of showbiz in one way or another. But the gluttony remains. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you see the piece of paper the other day about that? Yeah. Uh, there was a piece in the paper. I know some uh, sociologists are, you know, one of these smart types. Walk around wise and off all the time about life and all. Uh, he uh, maintains that in the uh, 19, late 1970s and all through the 80s, that the only sin, because everything will be so permissive by that time, you know, you can go out and pot your neighbor, you want to look target practice, you know, with a 30 odd and six. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're moving into that time. Oh, sure. Big signs, you know. Uh, eliminate jails. Nobody says eliminate crimes. They eliminate jails. So you see, that, that, that says something very important. It does. And uh, this is about 1980s. The only sin that will be a sin will be being fat. What is that? That will be a recognized sin, and people that will even land in jail for it. I mean, if they had jails at that time, they would. They have uh, re-education centers, of course. Naturally, you won't be able to go out at night because, you, you know, you get all uneducated when you leave. But the re-education centers is what we're going to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be re-educated. Of course, in some ways, you know, you know, you can only re-educate certain people with a rubber hose. A short length of it, you know. Thump them around the ears. Re-educate them. Well, uh, incidentally, I, I, I'm sorry about a bad thing that happened in England the other day. What happened? Well, London, actually. Hmm. An Englishman was dropping by helicopter in his garden for tea when his neighbor blasted him with a shotgun 12 days. <laughs> yeah, listen to this carefully. Uh, you apparently didn't hear what he was doing. An Englishman was dropping by helicopter into his garden for tea when his neighbor blasted him with a shotgun. The incident signaled the end of what had once been a friendship. I would imagine that, that you know, fairly true. First, the neighbors quarreled over a boundary wall between their expensive suburban London homes. I would say that he has a fairly expensive London home if he, you know, drops into his garden with his own helicopter. That's a fairly expensive London home. I'd say, yeah, well, you know. And they, they you know, they quarreled over the, over the wall. Then they quarreled over the noise made by one of them, Anthony Amato. He used to buzz the area in his light aircraft fly noisy model airplanes in his backyard and play his old hi-fi at top volume, the court was told. The final straw for his neighbor, Charles Bruder, came when Amato was circling low over his garden in a helicopter and knocking all the leaves all over the places. And it was, uh, you know, was, uh, causing a lot of excitement there. Um, Amato says he intended to land in the garden and have tea with his wife and family. Well, old brother Bruder reaches for a shotgun and fired twice as Amato... Or Amato hovered in his helicopter. He hit Amato with a cheek and leg. The helicopter did not crash, but uh, the guys aren't friendly anymore. <laughs> it gives you an idea what the uh, what what business do you think they're in? Sell so used cars. Uh, you figured it was Lord Amato, didn't you? No, sir. That's Chauncey Dildoc. <laughs> Well, I don't invent the news. I just bring it to you, gang. I mean, you know, what are you going to say? I only report it. Yes, I only report it. Listen to this one. This is enough to make you sick. Yes, sir. Flow up. A tricycle was thrown to the window of a manor drive apartment early Sunday, early Sunday morning in Union, New Jersey. Apparently an unidentified man who was angered because the occupant of the apartment refused to have a beer with him. Police said a large bearded man, about six feet five, and weighing over 200 pounds, came to the door of an apartment and asked Arnold Cohen if he wanted a beer. <laughs> oh, man.
man, I'll tell you, Jersey is a hotbed. <laughs> now, they didn't say it was a friend or anything, just large bearded man, six feet five. What would you do? Yeah, what do you want? Open up in there. Yeah, what do you want? Uh huh, you like to have a beer, buddy? What do you mean, beer? I don't know who you are. What do you mean, ain't you friendly? How about having a beer? Get out of here, you bum. Slam. Door slams. Guy grabs a tricycle, throws it through the glass, says, Nobody, no guy don't have no beer with me. He gets a tricycle in the living room. Yeah. Hello, hello, one, two, three. That was good. I like my little Jersey drama there. <laughs> hey, refuse. You know, that's, uh, there's a lesson in that all for all of us. Don't refuse a beer when you're in Jersey. Slow, yeah. There are certain guys in Jersey you just bust your arm right off of the socket. You refuse a beer. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's good. Well, that's the Well, I, I just feel in that kind of mood, you know. I, I, uh, it's uh, one of those moods. I just, uh, of course, you get, you get all kinds of moods. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about my old alma mater. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed that though. Seriously. I mean, I wish when I was out there they were teaching, you know, comic books and. Yeah, they they have a course now on rock appreciation. And, you know, a course on how to watch TV. You know, how to get the most out of Adam Twelve. And uh, oh yes, yes, that's it's, it's the new coming culture. That'll be taught in schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. There'll be a Marcus Welby retrospective. And uh, they'll run off reruns of old Lucy shows. And uh, I, I think ultimately uh, that'll be the literature of our time. Sure, guys, about the year two thousand, maybe five. Yeah, just, you, you went to Notre Dame, didn't you? Well, I was just talking about that, Don. Uh, big doings out there in the home state of Indiana. Yes, Indiana University now gives three credit hours. You can study comic books. Yeah, it's a new <laughs> culture is spreading out there. And uh, in fact, uh, as I pointed out, though, Don, that's nothing new. All the Textbooks that I used out there when I was there were comic books in one way or another. Anyways, so, you know, they just make it official. So uh, all the new things, none of, nothing new really starts here, out here in the East. No, the East is is really the last bastion of classical conservatism. It really is, and it is. It, it thinks it's you know it thinks it's totally with it, but it is not. No, it'll take uh, NYU for maybe three or four years to do a retrospective on TV viewing. As a three credit hour course, you know, and if you want to get an A in a course, you know, you can t turn in a term paper on, uh, of my favorite John Payne movie on the Late Late Show. And that kind of stuff. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the day when, when guys, uh, you know, in the graduate school here at NYU can turn in a paper like, what I did on my vacation. You, you think that's funny, Don? Now, wait a minute now. Now, you listen to me for one minute. I'm talking to Mr. Cricky, my old friend Don Cricky. Look at this now. I have a, I have a note here from um, the Los Angeles Times. Now, listen. No, no. You know why I quote these things? Because culture is happening out there, I see, and it's slowly sneaking this way. And uh, eventually, wait, uh, wait. Wait, every every campus will have its automatic uh, Chinese pizza burger joint right there next to the classical department. Here, listen to this now. This is from, uh, actually, uh, I'm not kidding about, about eventually guys will be able to get their MA by some, you know, MA in uh, classical English literature, something like that, you know, creative writing, like what I did on my vacation or my favorite uncle. Uh, <laughs> Boston, clad in an army fatigue jacket, the collar turned up over his long hair, the young man edged up to the crowded counter. He glanced to each side. A hold up? Hardly. Just another college student, in fact a graduate student, buying his term paper. They come in droves to the dingy looking second story offices of Term Papers Unlimited, one of about a half dozen firms which now through headquarters all over the country make up a new industry, ghost writing term papers for hard working, sensitive students. <laughs> really? Think I'm kidding? I mean, it's a fact. It's just a... <laughs> Listen to this. Uh, some of them still have a little, you know, vestige of uh, of uh, conscience about it. Uh, it says uh, this one that the reporter questioned. 
uh, was a little ashamed of what he was doing. I quote what he says. Do you want to hear what a student says? Yeah, I, uh, I never thought I'd uh, bring myself to come here, he told the girl behind the counter. Uh, this, this is degrading. Nevertheless, he bought a five-page essay entitled The Boston Police Strike of 1919 and its ramifications in today's society. 12.50 paid. Yeah, it's true. Uh, well, you know, I uh, just thought it would be... Uh, there's a national market, by the way. Papers, in case you haven't run into this... Now, have you ever heard of this before? A lot of you look a little surprised. You want to hear more about it? You know what? what, what one of the chicks says, well, today the cost of a college education is so great the student cannot afford to fail. That's why I always buy all my toy paper. So said a intellectual student at NYU. Girl type. <laughs> Moreover, the grading and testing systems are so arbitrary that in many cases so meaningless the students cannot feel they have any kind of fighting chance to make it through the system. There is no moral, moral principle or fiber in American university today. That's why I buy all my term papers. <laughs> what a fantastic... There, now there's true double think. No moral fiber in American universities. That's why I buy my term papers. <laughs> oh, man. Talk about that. Double think. Uh... But, uh, of course, uh, that's, it's, uh, it, it, <laughs> people never think their chicanery has anything to do with moral fiber. That, incidentally, that's a new new trend in our life today. It, it's, it's been coming for about 15 years that no matter what chicanery you're up to, whether it's buying a term paper or holding up a bank, you always blame it on the decadence of the society. <laughs> And, uh, of course, it's not that you're decadent at all. I mean, a guy buying a term paper is not decadent. Certainly not. He's only reacting to a decadent society. Of course. He doesn't want to cheat. He isn't a lazy bum. He isn't totally a dildoc who can't even write his name. He's reacting to a decadent society. Yes. Boom, ba -dum, boom, boom. Oh, well. It ain't easy. I mean, I mean, it ain't easy, really. It ain't easy being sneaky. Rotten people like me come along and point it out. Uh, Shepard, you don't understand, you know, Shepard. That's my problem, I do. Oh, sweet Adeline. La dee dee dee. La da da dee. La da da dee. Tonight we would like to report that Johnny Weissmuller has been mixing it up with the apes again. Johnny Weissmuller, well known at one time as Tarzan of the apes, seems to have lost his touch for the monkey business. Visiting relatives in Germany recently, he and his wife were guests on a local TV talk show in Germany. And he was asked to hold Porgy, a chimp barred from a zoo. After all, he is Tarzan. Porgy flipped his cork, screamed, knocked on a camera, ripped Mrs. Weissmuller's fur coat to shreds, and then did the unpardonable, even for a monkey. Porgy saturated Tarzan from head to toe. And it was in living color. Saturate him with? Hmm. What a great TV show that must have been. Oh, well. There's no respect anymore in the world. When a monkey named Porgy does that to Tarzan, what can you hope for? <laughs> what are you thinking about, Herb? <laughs> well, listen, I, 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 was, I was present when one of those things happened. One time, yeah. It was a minor bird. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I was I was uh, doing a TV show one time, and the uh, and the uh, the guy that did a show right before me was a live show he was doing, and I was live too. And uh, he was across the studio, and there were a lot of nice kids and everybody there. You know, he he did a show called uh, 
uh, hobbies for everybody. You know, the guy, he came out with the little kid music, you know. And then the announcer would come out, and now it's time for Hobbies for Everybody with your hobby master, Amos Alonzo Schrudel. And now here is old Uncle Strudel himself with today's hobby. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. We have the hobby for today. And look what we have here now. And by the way, Uncle Strudel was a very elegant man who, for some curious reason, you know, have you noticed kid shows tend to run to totally inexplicable costumes? Now, why? A, a, uh, for years, there was a guy here in town that did a show. For some reason, he wore a postman suit. You remember that one? Uh, I couldn't figure out what that, you know, what the meaning was, but he did. See, and he played cartoons. Then there was another guy who wears a cop suit. I don't know. Does he still do that with a cop? Oh yeah. Well, he's uh, he's going to be in trouble there. One day, one of the little activists is going to get him, you know, on the wing there, as he's just about to play, a, a, you know, a little king cartoon, a wham. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I, uh, uh, this guy, for some curious reason, wore a Hamburg hat, striped pants, and a cutaway coat. He dressed like an ambassador at the court of St. James. And he had a, had a fake German accent. I don't know what this show is all about, but Uncle Strudel. And uh, he wore this thing, and Uncle Strudel comes on, and he says, Well, we have today a wonderful, wonderful hobby. If you remember, boys and girls, yesterday we discussed a great hobby of match collecting, match book collecting. And don't we forget Uncle Strudel tells all of you not to light none of the matches, just collect the match covers. <laughs> well, today we have, look at this wonderful hobby here. We have with us here tonight little Lesbia O'Toole of 1422 15th Street out in Clifton, Ohio, whose hobby is raising minor birds. What talk? Oh, now, here's the little minor bird. And the camera dollies in here. Here's a big, fat, angry-looking minor bird. I said, tell us what you think of television, little Charlie. And, of course, little Charlie's been rehearsing for two hours across the set there. I saw him. Every time he'd say, what do you think of television, Charlie would go, oh, very good, oh, very good, oh, oh, oh. Well, this time, when Uncle Schrudel is on the camera live, he says, what do you think of television? But then, all of a sudden, the bird flapped his wings. Wowie! All over the front of the camera, all over about three kids in the front row, and everybody at that moment know what the whole tribe of minor birds, in fact, the minor bird world, thinks of television. Uncle Schrudel says, oh, my, my, quick, quick, give me a ring, quick. And so, friends, once again, we want, uh, gee, who is it there? It's on the tip of my tongue, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, uh, of course, uh, yes, uh, well, we're quoting Hal Holbrook here, uh, uh, somebody does something about the weather, only nobody does nothing about it, uh, oh, uh, shucks, no, that was, uh, oh, I forget, you know, see what happens if you forget too many things, uh, something is going to be in a sling, I forgot what it is, but, uh, well, you know, uh, six of one, half this, the other, Other new products are now available to uh, be walking around civilian. In the streets, you can now buy John paper with those little happy, smiling faces on them. Yeah. I don't make the news, honey. I only report it. So it's tonight's salute to Walter Cronkite. And the Bill Dock sided news.